want to have space and time for our speaker now. We're going to give a little space and time. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. Rue Reka Gregory holds, holds a master's in human development with a specialization in parent community work. She's a professor of early child education at Blue Mountain Community College in Pendleton, Oregon, USA, with 40 plus years of her career in education, including curriculum development, teaching, consulting, and work in parent education and early intervention with children zero to five years with disabilities. She's the founder and board chair of Pine Eagle Community Preschool in Halfway, Oregon, founder and co-director of the Harmony Home Nature Camp, part of Pine Eagle Art Camp, a summer program serving children of all ages, and she's a professor at New Mystic College of Asheville. <laughs> so I'm going to let her take it away, and she's going to talk a little bit, but I think she's also going to invite us to have questions and answers a bit because we're sharing here. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Vishala. Namaskar, everyone. Um, it's great to see everyone today. Um, so it sounds like we've got a group of people here that have varying levels of experience with children and interests and things like that. So uh, like Vishala said, I'll be inviting you to share, ask questions. Uh, this particular topic is one of those things that I'm prepared at any time to just put my presentation aside and answer your questions. So it's that kind of thing, because when you talk about challenging behaviors, um, there can be a lot of concerns and interest. So uh, with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'm really, really delighted to get to be the first speaker for this monthly experience that we're all going to be having. And I look forward to getting to know all of you and working on this, uh, on all these interesting topics. So the topic of transforming challenging behaviors brought up a lot of questions for me. Uh-oh, and now, you know, in the run through, it changed, there we go. Some of the questions that happen when we consider that topic are, first of all, what do we mean? Uh, are these behaviors that children are showing us challenging to whom? To us, to the child, um, to their parents? Who's being challenged? Is it an exciting challenge? Typically, this topic brings up very negative kinds of challenges people are experiencing. Like, oh my gosh, I'm tearing out my hair because this child is driving me crazy. This is often what happens when I bring up this, this subject. But we have to always step back and say, wait a minute, is the child only exhibiting a challenging behavior in a certain setting at a certain time of day? In which case, what role do we play in it? Are we struggling to fit square pegs into round holes, if you know that expression? You know, struggling to make that child fit the environment rather than adapting our environment to fit the child? Or how, how do we know that this behavior isn't simply typical for a certain developmental stage? Those of you who've been through my child development class know that there's so many factors surrounding where a child is in their own development at that time and how that interacts with what you're expecting from them, with what their parents are expecting, with what their culture is expecting. All those things come into play. And of course, as neo-humanists, we want to be all inclusive and accept everyone for who they are at whatever stage of development they're at. So with that in mind, I think I'd like to, you know, before going any further, ask if there are any particular concerns or questions um, in your mind. And you can just type in the chat or speak out, but if there's any particular issues that are coming up for you before I proceed. So this is very general kinds of ideas that I call laying the groundwork. You know, when you're first setting up your program and when you're considering children not coming just into your classroom and acting in a perfect orderly way, uh, but coming in as who they are as individuals, but a, 
but I want to get a couple of terms right with you because sometimes often people hear the word discipline and they consider it as a negative thing, as punishment. And really the definition has to do with teaching. Ambujo has written into the chat. I so appreciate you phrasing it that way because I agree so many behaviors are just challenging to our ego. Good point, Ambuja, of how we wanted the class to go. And letting go of some expectations makes bad behavior less disorienting. Oh, that is so beautifully said. Thank you, Ambuja. That's exactly the point I was trying to make. Um, yes, teaching is all about surrender. <laughs> it's all about letting aside our expectations. For example, as a teacher myself, so many times, you know, you over plan and you plan all kinds of wonderful activities and ideas. And half the time you have to throw them right out the window because the children come in with a whole other set of ideas and expectations, or they see the things that you set out for a particular idea that you'd like them to do. And they have a whole different idea about it. And that then becomes your curriculum. And likewise with today, that's why I just now asked for your ideas, because I have a ton of stuff set aside to describe to you and explain from my particular set of tools that I operate with, but I'm eager to hear your ideas as well. Um, another aspect to that whole foundational laying the groundwork would be that we begin each day with this idea of building on relationships with each child with their individual needs, their interests, their strengths, family life, temperament, learning style, their multiple intelligence area, if you're familiar with Howard Gardner's work and all these different aspects of intelligence. Um, we want to plan the environment carefully. Um, what are the messages the environment is sending? Maria Montessori made a big deal about the planned environment and it really does, it does say volumes how your environment is set out. What kind of pathways do you have in the classroom? <laughs> Simple example of that one is when I was contacted once with a um, preschool program that was run in a sanctuary of a church. And it's this huge, huge room. And the pathways, I mean, when the children walk in the door, it was obvious it was a freeway for running down. That was the message the environment was giving. So they called me. They said, why are the children running all the time in the classroom? And I walked in and I said, oh, because you don't have it set up with different interest areas and things that will break that space. If you don't want them to run, you have to set it up properly. Simple example to change that behavior. What is just the general tone you set in your environment? What kinds of degrees of stimulation are present in your environment? If you have a lot of disjointed things going on and bright lights and lots of colors that can be way too stimulating for a lot of children. Sometimes it's just good to get into your room or your yard on the child's level to understand what message they're receiving from your environment. It's important to build in positive reinforcements into your daily classroom life. Uh, for example, I've often seen this in very successful positive classrooms with something called the group kindness jar with beads or marbles. And every time someone reports, oh, this person was so kind to me just now, or oh, what a compliment I got, a marble or the bead would go into the jar. And when it's filled up, they'll have a class party to reward themselves. Uh, making space for children who just need to move, you know, having these lovely little bouncy seats that I've seen recently, um, fidget toys available, space to be alone. All of this is in, is by way of setting up for many individuals, allowing for their needs, allowing space to be alone, having plenty of time outdoors in a natural environment if possible. Um, but even if you aren't near nature or forest school, whatever you want to call it, having wonderful natural items out in your outside area and even inside. Yoga breathing throughout the day with visual reminders can help with developing self-regulation and just 
those reminders and working together and reminding each other to breathe throughout the day. Um, having classroom jobs, leadership roles, rotate those through, and including lots of artistic outlets and sports and lots of physical activity. These are the kinds of things that are just wonderful to build into your program. And again, if there's other things this is reminding you of, feel, feel free to uh, stop me, write in the chat, whatever you'd like to do. And here's what I like to call the three R's, relationship, relationship, relationship. Bonding is the key to any teaching experience. And I have to share here my own recent examples of some very poor teacher-child relationships in supposedly high quality schools. A school where you walk in and the environment is perfect and everything is beautiful. And there's so many wonderful activities set out for the child. But when you take a look at the relationships the, ch the teacher has with the children, maybe there's a few good ones, but it's not obviously the priority. Um, my own grandson, my youngest grandson, who's three and a half, um, was acting up, not following the teacher's expectation at this supposedly high quality school that had all kinds of accreditations and five stars according to the state of Oregon where I live. And it turned out the teacher simply hadn't made a bond with him. And he would get up and run around during circle time and story time. And this was a child who loves stories and loves puppets and songs and dancing. Um, when we finally decided that this was not working, we moved him to another preschool where the teacher, that's her main priority, is her relationship with her students. And of course, now he's having a lovely time. He's thriving there. He's a typical three-year-old. So sometimes it's just in that teacher relationship that makes a huge difference. There's this idea of creating a caring school community of resilience. And I really encourage everyone to be aware of what's now called trauma-informed practices in education. There's a wonderful film called Paper Tigers about a school actually in my area in the Northwest United States that decided to shut down the school and rethink everything because it just wasn't working. This was, a, uh, I believe, a middle school um, of older children. And they totally looked at creating a trauma-informed school so that everyone was trained on how you work with people so that in case there is some kind of trauma in the child's life, you know that you're not going to reawaken it by your educational practices, right? So even the bus drivers, the janitors, the school cafeteria people, they were all trained in this. And it's so helpful it, it completely transformed the school. And so this documentary film, Paper Tigers, is remarkable how it shows the stages this school went through. So I hope, I would hope people are aware of these things. Um, one example of a, of a trauma-informed situation I was in, um, I had a child quite a while ago, he was uh, five, and he was in my early intervention um, caseload, he was receiving speech therapy, and I think he had some trouble with his fine motor skills, so he had an occupational therapist. So these people would come into his preschool and work with him. But most importantly, he had experienced severe trauma as a toddler because, unfortunately, he had witnessed his older brother being murdered by the foster care providers it was such a tragedy. His mother had surrendered the children to the foster care system for the year or two she needed, or maybe it was even less, maybe just six months that she needed to go through drug rehabilitation therapy. So this little boy was a year and a half and his brother, I believe was three and a half or four. And she continually told the system that her sons were coming home to visit with bruises, but the system did not you know, they chose to believe the foster providers who said, no, there was no problem and that they were coming back to them with bruises from her. They were lying. So 
the ultimate thing, the horrible tragedy occurred where he did observe his brother being murdered by this foster provider. So now fast forward to age five, you know, he's living with his mother and they're trying to make a life together and he's in early intervention and I'm his case manager. And we placed him at a preschool that said, they assured the mother, they said, you know, we don't care what kind of challenging behaviors he brings. We will never, never reject him uh, because she was worried that they wouldn't take him. And it only took about three months for them to finally say, no, we can't handle his behaviors. Because based on his trauma he's been through, there were so many things that could trigger it. And, you know, it's it's it, it's very tragic what happened because the, the, the school finally said we can't handle him. I had to be called in several times because he was hiding under a table. Well, I'm sorry, he wasn't harming anyone. That was his way of dealing with the situation that he was in at that time. Um, but ultimately, we got him into a preschool that was completely accepting, and he was able to relax and feel feel cared for. And I don't mean to be using this example as a way to say that it's always the caregiver's fault that brings on these challenging behaviors. But I guess my point is there's always a reason for behaviors. If a child is frightened, it's going to come out as a, as in some way. And how nice it would have been if we'd been more informed of trauma-informed practices back then. So from uh, P.R. Sarkar and uh, the founder of Neo-Humanism, uh, we have a book called Foundations of Neo-Humanist Education. And here I, I have a few quotes I thought were quite relevant here. It says, learning that takes place when fear or intimidation is present will soon be forgotten. The teacher may accomplish some short-term gains in this manner, but at the expense of long-term outcomes. And one of our wonderful neo-humanist schools in Australia, there's a quote here, as emphasized in the Ananda Marga River School in Mullaney, Australia, teachers need to protect every student's right to feel safe, happy, and free to learn. They correct in such a way that fosters a climate of compassion, empathy and understanding. Teachers learn progressive models of discipline and there is no corporal punishment, no humiliation, no verbal abuse or any other type of psychic or physical punishment. And finally, all children require an emotionally secure environment that supports their developing self-knowledge, self-control and self-esteem, and at the same time encourages respect for the feelings and rights of others. Young children experience many conflicting feelings and ideas, independence and dependence, confidence and doubt, fear and power, hostility and love, anger and tenderness, aggression and passivity. They require a reliable environment and secure relationships with teachers as they process these feelings and learn more about themselves. An emotionally safe climate permits children to acknowledge all feelings, both pleasant and unpleasant. The free and open expression of feelings enable the teacher to formulate positive strategies for assisting children in channeling those expressions more positively and enlisting further support where needed. This brings up the idea too of of creating a school climate where people are all accepting of each other, that the children are encouraged to be very empathetic and caring for each other as well. Um, so here's some more wonderful quotes from Pierre Sarkar, but I am going to move forward. These are just these are just inspirational educational comments here. Um, I wanted to draw your attention to a wonderful book called "Please Don't Sit on the Kids" by one of my favorite authors, Claire Cherry, and she has in there this wonderful list called the magic list and i've known many teachers who tape this one up right by the door so they're always remember or someplace where they hang out or their desk or whatever um so they can just really keep in mind that there's a lot of wonderful tools to keep in mind when you are struggling with someone when you're trying to figure out what how, how can i reach this child 
And um, so there's 16 of these and they're just lovely. Anticipate trouble, give gentle reminders, distract to a positive model, inject humor, offer choices, give praise and compliments, offer encouragement, clarify messages, overlook small annoyances, deliberately ignore provocation. You know, when to ignore is always a good one, right? Reconsider the situation. Point out the natural or logical consequences. Provide renewal time. Give hugs and caring. Arrange discussion among children and provide discussion with an adult. I also want to make you aware of someone named Dr. Becky Bailey, who created what's called conscious discipline. <clears throat> and it's a whole system of wonderful, wonderful tools to use in the classroom. Uh, use it looking specifically at our brain states. But these are these are some wonderful things to put on the wall about different types of breathing. And the star in particular is lovely. It's called smile, take a breath and relax. And having children choose which breathing method do you want to use right now uh, is a wonderful, wonderful way to run your classroom. We want to encourage classes to really build empathy And then when, you have, when you're faced with a specifically difficult, challenging behavior, one where you're going, I just don't know how to handle this child. There's ways that I encourage people to approach it. And one is to see a challenge as exactly that, a wonderful thing. Like I'm gonna learn, we're gonna transform and we're gonna learn from this. Observation and assessment is always key because there's always a reason for a behavior. And I wanted to share this amazing tool called the behavior has meaning chart. And where you choose a behavior, this is for very young children, but you choose the behavior. In this case, it says socially withdrawn. And then you turn the little dial, or actually it tells you some things right here. It says, observe, learn, and respond. And it has different possible ways you can do these things. This is also available in Spanish. I love this tool. And I, um, I get these from the National Association for the Education of Young Children. And I can put that information in the chat. The other thing to be aware of is what I call the ABC, the antecedent, the behavior, and the consequence, where the antecedent is what, ha what happens before the behavior what does the behavior itself look like? And then what is the consequence of the behavior? So it's one way to, to shape this in your mind. It's a way to watch for behavioral patterns so they can be addressed and dealt with. You know, we have to be great detectives when we're working with kids. Find out how that's dealt with at home. Find out if they even see the behavior there. What, what you know, kind of unpack it this way. We can look at the behavior and involve the child and the parents in what's called a behavior plan or a contract. These are the expectations. How can we work with you on this? I've seen very successful use of what they call a good day book, where you just have a special little book the child can make and you're documenting positive behaviors and progress that the child contributes to every day in class, takes home, the child and parents can document things that happened that are very positive, wonderful behaviors that you're looking for. And finally, the idea of a social story and using visual cues. For children, especially with autism, it's wonderful to make a story for them about, about whatever it is they're working on. Like Sam wants to know how to play with other children. Here's Sam. Here's some children doing something he'd like to join in. Here's how he does it. Here's the steps, right? You just take it step by step and write it out for the child. It helps them transform their behavior and practice, practice, practice. Some there's people nice, use... Right, there, there's, there's a nice comment in the chat where someone said, um, instead of doing timeouts, for discipline, do time-ins to regulate their emotions. Perfect. Oh, thank you, Suleika. That's a great one. Yeah, because we want to use these things as positives. 
Um, in fact, in the conscious discipline system, they always have a special place where children can go to be alone and there'll be some pillows and supportive things in there for them and those little breath charts, you know, things that they can do when they're learning to regulate. It, it's just a wonderful thing. Some people really love star charts. I'm not a fan, but for some kids, they love it. Some It works for some children. If they can follow along when they do a specific behavior that they're learning and they get a little star, they get a little sticker, and then at the end of the week, they get a meaningful reward. I love this next one. The child becomes an expert. They learn how to help and counsel others because we're all working on something. And what I mean by expert and this is going to sound a little funny, but I tell you, it works. Um, we had a child once who was really into spitting. And they just loved to spit. And it happened at a lot of different times. So we said, oh, you know, if you're a spitter and you really feel like spitting, there are places where you can do that. Here's the sink. Here's the toilet. Or when you're outside, here's this tree, the spitting tree, whatever. <laughs> and... I tell you, we we decided to have kids be experts about everything. We had little expert buttons, and that child was the expert spitter and, you know, could spit watermelon seeds. I mean, we worked on all kinds of positive ways you can spit, but we said he was the expert on spitting. And when another child was new to the class and was also like to spit, was going through a spitting phase, whatever you want to call it, we said, oh, go talk to him. He's the expert on spitting. He'll show you what to do. Sounds funny, but it was a way of really working with that behavior in a positive way. So you're kind of giving them outlets. The, the use of logical and natural consequences, for example, having the child mop up the mess they made or help a child that you hurt um, can be very, very helpful. The idea of restorative justice concepts that are promoting fairness and they're not punitive. Mahajoti says, give a child opportunities to help the teacher and help others to be a valued member of the community. Absolutely. She also says, using creative activities and breath work. Yes, definitely. Um, and consider modeling, mentoring, and meaningful work in the community. It really does take a village to raise a child. I knew a child who was just not working out in any structured classroom. You know, the teachers just had to really hit their heads against the wall and say, what can we do for this boy? And having him find meaningful work in the community, and there was a, a man who was actually quite good at foster care and helping children who needed, who had lots of troubles. He was able to take him on his ranch and help with the horses and do other kinds of things that were very meaningful in service work in the community. Um, and he could also be a positive role model and mentor this child. You know, sometimes you just have to think outside the box and outside your classroom, right? <laughs> and say, okay, what's going to work for this child? And uh, that was that was very helpful to this young man. Just doing a time check, Reka, that we're kind of out of time, so. Yes. So I just wanted to mention once again, this behavior wheel that I use, uh, feeling charts on the wall and other visual cues can be very helpful throughout the day. And I guess my last slide is this idea of when to seek help. Because some people think, oh gosh, I can't give up on the child. I have to work with them no matter what. Well, again, don't beat your head against the wall. Think outside the box. If When is the best time to refer to support services, such as counseling or special education? When you have serious concerns that the child may harm their, themselves or others, the child is at least six months behind their peers in physical, cognitive, social, or emotional development. And of course, it's always good to be sure to keep careful notes of your observations. So that's what I've got there. And stop sharing. So I think I gave you a lot of food for thought and people have a lot of great ideas. So what questions, what comments do you have?
or perhaps an example of a child that you'd like to really hear from others about what you can do about? Well, there's, there, there's a lot being said about overdiagnosis of ADHD, right? I mean, yes, it is a real thing, and people who ha have it really need that extra help, but sometimes it's just not not the right thing to say about someone. It's really not correct. What And you channeled that energy beautifully. What, another thing that builds empathy that Becky Bailey says in Conscious Discipline is what we call wish you well, where you teach the kids that, oh, you hear someone else that's having a problem in another part of the room, they would stop and take a breath and say, oh, we wish you well. Mm -hmm. Oh, and it just builds that supportive feeling, you know, that whole classroom community and family. We have to do the best we can within our classroom environment in some situations where parents are just not amenable to working with you, although we can certainly keep trying with the parents as much as we can. What kinds of behaviors are you seeing? The building the relationship is everything. You know, if, if, if home is unstable, school needs to be the stable place. So building that relationship with the child is really, really crucial. And finding out what it is they're trying to involve, trying to avoid in school, because if school is the stable place, you want him to stay there. So working out a contract with that child about what it is that would work best for them in certain situations, you know, you can, at, at that age, even some younger ages, you can really put it to the child. We can work this out. I'd really like to make things work for you at school. Yeah, and that's why, that's a good point. That's why I was suggesting somehow making some connections. You know, it's nice to have a team approach if all the people working with the child can get together, you know, with the parents, I mean, the parents sign off and say, yes, we're overcoming the confidentiality. So we can all put our heads together for the good of our child. Oh, lots of things coming in the chat. Great. Thank you, everyone. It was great to meet you all. Yeah.